technology. Um, yeah, can you see, or have I switched you off or something? Can you see it now? Certainly can. Good, okay. So um, what I, my, my claim here is, if I'm now back to here, sorry. Uh, my claim here is that there is a turning point in the 15th century that until then, all these things, killing clergy, pillaging from peasants, stealing from merchants and rape, were prohibited in one's own lands. But that from the late 15th century, they begin to be applied to enemy civilians. That to me is the great breakthrough because all of a sudden it's beyond the, we should be more moderate with regard to our own folk. And it is some sort of divination of a universal humanity where even people on the other side deserve of, of, of a war, deserve this protection. And the turning point is perhaps to be found in some ordinances issued by Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy in 1473 and 76, where he, uh, he specifically says um, it was prohibited to pillage or, or steal in friendly lands and the violation of sanctuary was uh, um, prohibited in friendly or enemy lands and the rape of women in friendly or enemy lands. And now that is um, what I'm claiming because after that I find that ordinances actually include enemy lands as areas that should also have the same treatment. This would fit some work that I've only recently um, become acquainted with uh, on the decline of violence in the West. So this is a sort of Pinkerian approach, but I haven't realized that some real historians argue this as well. Uh, Gregory Hamlin has written a sort of summary article about that and, and um, Monchemblet uh, and Spierenberg are the authors who've really done the, the legwork on this. So what I find in the ordinances of the 16th and the mid 19th century is that they still tend to be in the same way uh, issued for in ad hoc for a particular military campaign, um, and, uh, but also in manuals of war. And a very typical example, just, just taken almost randomly from one of the many, many uh, ordinance, sets of ordinances I've looked at, uh, here we find that upon pain of death are prohibited, les majesty, all deliberate homicide, murder, sexual conduct against nature, incest, bigamy, kidnapping, forceful abduction, etc., etc. But it now applies also to enemy territory on which people are. And that to me is the big difference between what happened in ordinances before the late 16th, 15th century and what happens thereafter. We find ordinances an awful lot, and this is one of the reasons I think that people haven't worked on this uh, a lot, um, in scattered in various war manuals. All these war manuals on the art of war actually contain a set of ordinances at the end saying all these things that have to be um, respected and include generally these points that I have just mentioned. And these are, um, there are examples of standalone ordinances that still exist um, all the way up to uh, the Lieber Code that was only issued in the American Civil War. Um, but on the whole, the patterns of the, these ordinances tend to be the same, with the exception of a different set of ordinances, which are all about how soldiers shouldn't run away, uh, go AWOL, uh, and how they should respect their officers. This raises very big questions still for me about how violent some of those particular periods of early modern history were that were are alleged to be very violent. So the confessional wars from the Hussite Wars to the Jacobite uprisings um, were always described by contemporaries and also afterwards by historiography as ex exceptionally horrible and exceptionally violent. And this is where I need the early modern historians to tell me what the latest is on this one. Um, we all know the, the, the Spanish Wars of Conquest and the Dutch Eighty Years' War uh, de depicted uh, on the right-hand side. Um, led to the Leyenda Negra about the terrible behavior of the Spaniards whenever they were confronted with asymmetric adversaries. Um, is that still seen as such or is this all simply Dutch propaganda? Uh, can we now really truly say that violence became less and that compassion somehow grew in early modern times in these contexts? So in the next one, this is obviously a question for Peter Wilson specifically, how violent was the Thirty Years' War? Um, which one is closer to reality, the Simmelshausen paradigm of the deliberate cruelty or the indirect effects paradigm, that civilian deaths were mainly in, aroused in consequence of famine and plague are either 
turning away syndrome, as I called it at the very beginning. You know, the, the, the fact that soldiers just have, didn't have the resources to ensure that civilians were kept alive, or I mean, that they pillaged if they, because if they had the choice between surviving themselves or having those peasants out there survive, they knew what their priorities were. That's a, a question on which I'd very much like to invite comments from the experts here present, virtually. I am tempted to side, again, as a non-expert, with um, Hervé Drévillon, who was, is very much, uh, very dismissive of the myth of the limited cabinet wars of the period after the Thirty Years' War and before the French Revolution, La Guerre en Tempelle, um, which, according to Clausewitz, was so wonderfully limited, and which, according uh, a, a trope that Moltke and Karl Schmitt uh, took up, you know, the idea that armies were paid by the treasury and the people were not really involved. Uh, war thus became the business exclusively of the governments. War thus essentially became a real game, looting and devastation of enemy territory, which had played such an important part in the warfare of the ancients and even the Middle Ages, were no longer regarded as acceptable to the spirit of the age. War was thus limited and more, uh, and more limited more to the armed forces themselves. Is this actually true? Was this true? As I said, Moltke and Karl Schmidt and others picked it up. But uh, Hervé Drévillon's L'Impôt du Sang uh, goes very much against this narrative. And the wars of uh, Louis XIV uh, in particular um, seem to take it out on civilians. The, um, were they just brutal but localized? And um, Hervé Drévillon writes particularly about the wars uh, of the subsequent period, uh, the 18th century, that they probably had higher casualty figures on battle fields um, among these closely packed rows of soldiers who had to advance uh, towards the firing line of their enemies, that these were probably higher than in periods both before and afterwards. Looking back at our um, ordinances, we see that from the second half of the 19th century, we move from ordinances being customary law and adopted unilaterally by individual governments to becoming multilateral treaties. And on the left, you see some of these multilateral treaties that were concluded. It's just a selective list before the Second World War, and then on the, uh, the right-hand side, the ones that were concluded after the Second World War. Very, very crucially among these is, of course, that the Hague draft rules on aerial warfare were never ratified which meant that air warfare could take place and not be against the uh, conventions that were uh, operational at the time. So in parallel to what can be seen and what I'm seeing as a fairly linear development of an increase in compassion reflected in these ordinances of war, gradually spreading to encompass not only people who are useful to you or people who are your fellow countrymen, but also to people in the enemy nation, we see the totally opposite development, particularly in the 19th century, but also I think in the religious wars before that, where the enemy is perceived not just as another government and its armed forces, but an entire polity, an entire society, and in the context of nationalism, of course, that will be called a nation, the enemy nation as evil. We'd already encountered with the religious wars, the enemies of God, um, Islam versus Christendom, in which different rules obtained when one was fighting against them, but also in the confessional wars among Christian denominations, arguably. But then with nationalism coming in, but if the, nat the ethnic nationalism, um, warfare becomes hyped up to be something that is by nation against nation, and one is gradually sliding towards the Ludendorffian definition of genocidal total war, which was, of course, uh, it took, uh, reached its, its summit, its horrible summit, with the Herrera massacres in the early 19th century, 20th century then the uh, uh, Armenian genocide, and then completely unsurpassed in terms of number, what the Nazis did to both Jewish communities, but also the Slavs that they managed to get their hands on and, and the famines that they enforced on the Soviet Union. In the Aryan bombardment in particular, you find that this is, um, you know, there's this amazing lack of compassion, uh, which many people have explained in terms of the distance between this, the, the victim, the physical distance between the victim and the people in, uh, applying the, the bombing. 
Um, but it had been used, of course, before in colonial warfare as a cheap form of counterinsurgency in the mid in the 1920s and 1930s, so the interwar period. It was used in the Second World War as a cheap or not costly in human lives alternative to an early invasion, which would have been very casualty hefty on the side of the Allies. And it is even now seen very often as something that would be limiting of Western casualties and therefore airstrikes could be equated to la guerre zero mort, this idea that you can not have a lot of casualties on your own side. The, the very idea of zero mort going back to the pre late 15th century idea where you want to spare people only on your own side, of course, which is very interesting. So getting to the genocide bit again, um, I've already mentioned the German genocide of the Lama and the Hereros, which was interestingly, again, a sort of turning away syndrome. You know, people were left to die of thirst and starve rather than being directly killed. Or there were instances of direct killing as well, but there was this element also of, you know, they've been pushed into the desert and now they're no longer our problem, which is easier to comprehend, I think, than it is to comprehend a, a direct and deliberate killing of people um, with, with uh, blank weapons. You find exactly the same pattern in the Turkish genocide of the Armenians, where there's again this turning away from them, they're, they're driven to the desert areas, they're driven to areas where they didn't have enough water or food and they were left to starve and die. So there's this element of turning away uh, in the practice of this. The German genocide of Slavs, Jews, Sinti and Roma combined both. There was the deliberate starvation of the Slavs and Soviet citizens in part through turning away um, but there was also the very, very active rounding up and, as we know, industrial killing of uh, other groups. So it's a combination of the two, uh, but you can in the same way see that there's a lot of people just saying, you know, we, uh, if you're turning people out into the, the cold winter, having destroyed their villages in occupied areas of Western Russia, well, that, that's not our problem any longer. Um, they will maybe left to die, but that's not something we don't, we're going to bother about. Uh, just to remind you then of the uh, convention of uh, crime of genocide and what it actually says, it's the causing serious public bodily harm, causing things is a way to do it exactly the same way as the direct killing. Now my question that I'm almost finishing with now is the question of whether democide and genocide since the Second World War um, has occurred frequently or in, in by incompetence and neglect or by deliberate policy, and we definitely find both. Um, it is alleged on the whole that the Holodomor had a large element of neglect and incompetence, even by people that I know from Kazakhstan and Ukraine, whereas others say it was very much a deliberate killing and a deliberate um, uh, policy. Um, the great Chinese Famine seems to have been a deliberate policy, at least in part, but po possibly at least at the beginning, one of, the, of neglect and incompetence and turning away. Uh, Pol Pot's genocide in Cambodia was definitely deliberate policy. There was no element of turning away or neglect there. The Rwandan genocide was definitely a case of the direct deliberate policy and uh, direct action. And on a much smaller scale, but nevertheless, it needs to be mentioned, Srebrenica was, of course, very direct action and not simply a question of uh, turning away. So, uh, to sum up, I'm claiming, or I see, and perhaps I'm seeing wrongly, a continuity, a continuous humanization of the laws of war in Europe, um, starting with pretty lacking compassion rules in ancient Greece and pre-Christian Rome. But since the Christianization of the Roman Empire, a very slow but steady spread of ordinances prohibiting killing civilians, first on one's own side and then on both sides. But against this, a fluctuating practice in which these, this tendency towards the humanization of war is in strong competition with other drivers which very often override it. On the one hand, the necessity, or in, in one case, the necessity with armies living off the land when simply the societies were not sophisticated enough to be able to organize the feeding of armies over a longer period of drive time without letting them live from the land. Then the element of profits to be taken from looting and slavery. 
Then the element of hatred, hatred of other religions or hatred afterwards with nationalism of other groups. The breakdown of discipline and the ever-present temptation to turn away from other people's suffering, which I think is just a very strong human element. But there was also later on then a technological temptation which hadn't quite existed before, namely the idea that uh, air bombardment is a cheap way of winning and with the distance between the perpetrators of the bombardment and the victims, it is much easier to overcome any normal human resistances to killing other human beings. And my question to you is, um, is compassion something that is natural or culture specific? And to what extent is it, why have, do we see this uh, coexistence of this continuous trend to humanize war that comes from the church, comes from the lawyers, and comes from ethically minded people, and yet the, this reluctance to implement it and, and with all these other drivers working against it, and can one actually get beyond this, uh, this dichotomy? Is that something that can be ultimately learned, imposed, and fostered? And I'd very much like to hear your reactions to this and also to this theory about the diminution of uh, violence in early modern times and how you can reconcile this with the idea of a greater tolerance of violence than in the ages of nationalism and then in the 20th century. So here we go. And that is my uh, talk now. Uh, I welcome your comments. Thank you very much.